over to Shane Ward, um, who is a regenerative agriculture advisor and has just returned back to our shores after being um, overseas for a while. So give a big round of applause to Shane. Thanks very much. So I'm Shane Ward, that's me. Um, <laughs> I'm the founder of uh, Action Ecology, uh, and I advise people on regenerative land use and sustainable food systems. This is the kind of stuff that I get excited about. Design, soil, water, restoration, and also talking to nice people like you about it. I'm here tonight to talk about regenerative agriculture. Um, so hopefully there's some good news in this that you can walk away from. But before we get into all that, it's probably worth just taking a moment to reflect on a couple of really important things. Looking back, we need to really understand that despite all of our accomplishments as a species, we owe our existence to a thin layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Looking forwards, we have to remember that without a permanent agriculture, there can be no permanent civilization. So where that leaves us now is that we have a lot of problems, which I'm sure you're all aware of. And a great many of them are either created by or exacerbated by agriculture. But there's a really important thing to remember about this, is that it's not what we produce, but how we produce it that's the problem. Or put another way, it's not the cow, it's the how. The dominant way that we produce the things that we eat and just use the land generally, often referred to as conventional, but actually is industrial agriculture, which we've mentioned tonight. And what that means is we're talking about an artificial simplification of something complex into something very simple in order just to make it easy to use. We apply synthetic nitrogen, as we've talked about a lot tonight, nutrients onto the soil. We kill the soil biology. We completely ignore any of the natural processes which maintain fertility. We create the perfect conditions in these monocultures growing a single crop or species uh, for pests and pathogens and weeds. And then of course we have to spray biocides, you know, herbicide, fungicide, pesticide, etc., to kill those problems that we've created in the conditions that we've, we've set up. We have a very narrow lens with which we look at the landscape. So we look at it in a very single-minded way. For example, it's either pasture or it's not pasture. It's either helping me or I'm not interested. We have this very industrial mentality. We, look, we try to leverage economies of scale. We try to focus on performance, yield. We try to maximise efficiency, as if this was a production line. And of course, this is all about producing products which we then take to market in order to produce profit. But all of this is, of course, only possible with fossil fuel inputs and the use of biocides. Without those things, the whole thing falls down. And what that really means is that we have a food system. In fact, this is probably true of any system, but it's particularly concerning with the food system. That this system is not safe if it only works in the good times. And there's something that I think COVID has shown us is around the world just how brittle and fragile this food system is. So what's the alternative? Well, regenerative agriculture is what I'm here to talk to you about. I'll give you a quick definition before I explain what it really is. It is the design and management of productive land use through mimicry of diverse natural ecosystems that harnesses and restores ecological function to produce food, fibre and fuel, informed by observation of and continual adjustment to feedback. And I'll explain what all this means. So what's the difference between sustainable and regenerative? Well, basically, sustainable means something that you can do forever. It can be sustained. Regenerative is what we are talking about with natural systems, because natural systems have a natural regenerative capacity. That's how they function. So in order for our food system or our land use to be sustainable, it has to be managed in a way that is regenerative. But of course, people have and will continue to misunderstand, misuse and abuse these terms and co-opt them for their own purposes. But it doesn't change what they actually mean. So how is it different from industrial agriculture? 
Well, it's different in a, quite a few ways, but there's probably a really a key way that it's different. And the first is that we move from imposing simplicity to managing complexity. What does that mean? Well, we deal with closed loop systems. That's what we're striving towards, just like natural systems. This is not a linear production line. Waste is a human invention. In natural systems, we don't have waste. Everything, the output of one thing is the input to another. And that's what we strive for when we design and manage these systems ourselves. We embrace complexity. Rather than try to artificially simplify things, we embrace just what's there and try to work with it. Systems thinking is really important. We try to acknowledge and connect everything, all these connections which are actually there. Again, this is about not ignoring reality, it's about embracing it. It's also about, instead of imposing a simplified industrial pattern onto the landscape, we try to look to nature to learn what works. We've got three and a half billion plus years of R&D that nature's been doing. We should be looking up there. It's what biomimicry is. It's trying to understand what is nature done. How has nature solved these problems in the past and what can we learn from that? So how does it work? The key thing about regenerative agriculture is to understand that it is not about processes. And that's one thing that's really different from, say, organic or biodynamic uh, approaches, which are great. But this is not about what techniques you do. This is about... I suppose your mindset, your, the approach that you're taking to how you manage the land, like I've just talked about, and also about outcomes, the goal for what you're doing. So it's knowledge, not process-based. And that's a big shift from industrial agriculture, where, you, for example, someone could give you a recipe of do this, spray this, apply this, plough this, etc., and you follow the sequence. This is about understanding the system that you're in, understanding how the natural things in it interact and how you can work with those. It's about integrating things. It's about maximising diversity. It's because it's through diversity that we have resilience in our landscapes. There's also, of course, the ability to get multiple yields. And that can mean uh, you get multiple profit lines from various things that you're producing. You're connecting elements. We're also, fundamentally to all of this, is about looking after the soil. The soil is a living ecosystem. It is not just something which keeps plants upright. It is not just a sponge for nutrients. It's a living thing in and of itself. So we do not till. We try to increase biomass and we try to harness as much photosynthesis as possible because that's the energy that drives the whole system, not fossil fuels. We work with webs, cycles and loops, not linear things. We try to be responsive to context. And in fact, this is probably a really key thing as well. So when done well, the pattern of land use that we have, whether we're talking about grazing or horticulture or forestry or whatever it may be, hopefully all of those things, the things that we choose are appropriate for the landscape that we're in, appropriate for the climate, the topography, you know, the rainfall, everything. We don't just come in with a preconceived idea and stamp it onto the landscape and then use fossil fuels to fix all the problems we've just created by ignoring what's actually there. The idea is that it's designed and strategic, so we are thinking through where this, how this works, and also how is this system going to evolve over time? How do we work with that? How do we improve it and restore the function? There are a lot of different methodologies out there for sort of how you can do that, and I like to think of them all as essentially just all tools in a toolbox, and you'll find that the practitioners out there that are doing this stuff are using several of these potentially at any one time, or, or they'll move from some to others at different times. They're all valid, uh, and they all help. There's, you, know, you probably can't read all that stuff. It's not really important. The, the, really, the key thing is that, well, it is important, but it's not important that you read it all right now. Mm. What it's about is that we are looking after soil. We are looking after water. We are always thinking about those things, always thinking about soil and water, because without those things, we can't really grow anything. We are always trying to maximise diversity and the resilience of the landscape. And that resilience is not just resilience to climatic events or to weather, but resilience economically as well. We are always trying to achieve the highest health and standard of welfare for, for, the, for the landscape that we're working with. So that includes, of course, the animals, but also the plants and everything else. We want healthy living ecosystems because they're the ones that look after us with managing them. Probably the most important thing is that at the end of all this, all these potential benefits that we can get is that we can achieve higher production of human nutrition per square metre than any other system on Earth. And you, you'll see in a second, well, 
hopefully it's clear why, but if not, we'll get to it in a second. Because what that allows us to do is we can help not only, <coughs> uh, I guess, stop doing some of the bad stuff, we can reverse some of the damage that we've already done, and we can feed humanity forever. An example of this, one of my favourite examples of a really evolved system is in Wisconsin in the United States. So this is Mark Shepard, and he's been running this system now for 30 plus years. And what he has done is he's taken 110 acres of former maize, so it's monoculture corn, and converted it to a highly diverse, integrated, perennial, silvo-arable pasture system with multiple income streams. He uses oak savanna as his ecological model, and he has trees, shrubs, vines, canes, uh, herbaceous plants, animals, all integrated into a system. The livestock are managed in conjunction with the plants to mutual benefit. So for example, the trees get the benefit of weed control and fertilisation from the grazing animals, and the animals get shade and shelter from food from the trees, and so on and so forth. It's entirely solar and wind powered, this farm, and the equipment is run only using locally produced biofuels that are not taken from the human food chain. By stacking the production on top of each other, having a tall tree producing, say, chestnuts with apples underneath it, raspberries underneath that, cut flowers and herbaceous crops underneath that, in an alley of asparagus with five different types of animals, you stack all that function. There's no way a monocultural system, no matter what yield it claims to get, could compete against something like this and you can do it forever. There are also lots of great examples in New Zealand of farmers who are doing this stuff, and many more every week who are getting, I guess, on, on their own journey towards this stuff. So please go out, find out who these people are and support them, because they are really trying to do the best that they can. So I'll just leave you on a parting thought. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Thank you.